our hope is that tonight you'll come out with a better understanding of those dynamics as well as the situation on the ground because we have with us um, Maria Antonia Tigre, who's a senior attorney for the environmental program at the Cyrus R. Vance Center for International Justice and has just written this fabulous book uh, that's called Regional Cooper Cooperation in Amazonia. And so we'll get a great look at that. I'm also joined here tonight by Steve Schwartzman, who's the senior director for tropical forest policy at the Environmental Defense Fund and our very own Juliana Barbasa, who's the managing editor of America's Quarterly and also a uh, director of our policy program here at, at ASCOA. So um, let me start uh, with Steve, uh, who, you know, I, Steve, what can you tell us about in general terms about the situation for deforestation right now? What has gone poorly? Um, what, if anything, do you think has gone well? And what's your sense of, of where all this is headed in the next year, two years, three years? Um, okay, well, first of all, um, thanks to the America Society for putting this on, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I think you know, the first point, which is still too little recognized uh, around the world, is that Brazil continues to be today the world leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions because of the reductions in the deforestation rate in the Amazons between 2004 and 2016. It's, um, I don't know, and it's, uh, it's not even close. There's no other individual country that is, uh, that is uh, even vaguely close. It's what, three and a half billion tons CO2 equivalent, bus over 99,000 square kilometers of deforestation avoided. That's the good news. Um, I think um, another uh, fundamental to, this, to that whole phenomenon, another part of the very important news, is that um, uh, Brazil has, over the last 30 years or so, um, created an amazing network of legally recognized indigenous territories <clears throat> and protected areas, which the indigenous peoples and other local communities still largely control access to. Um, and that's uh, really one of the things that's, that has uh, been most critical in allowing Brazil to make this, this huge achievement. Um, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, and the last. Well, if we back this up to, to, to where the whole initiative really started, which was uh, in Lula's first term with Marina Silva as uh, <coughs> Minister of Environment and the National Plan to Control and Prevent Amazon Deforestation uh, that Marina Silva and her team conceived and, uh, and launched, uh, they really put together a very compelling and, and well thought out plan. It had roughly two parts. It had carrots and it had sticks. It had command and control, it had incentives. Well, the federal government and a bunch of the state governments as well have gotten um, pretty good at the sticks, or they had gotten until the economic crisis uh, kind of trashed all the budgets. Uh, but the incentives have never materialized. And there are important opportunities or potential opportunities that could be very significant, particularly through the climate negotiations that Brazil has, um, has refused to uh, address seriously. So you have a situation where you can talk to any single one of the Amazon governors or Amazon state environmental secretariat, secretaries, and they will all tell you, um, Command and control alone is not enough. We are never going to be able to maintain these, uh, uh, these gains. We're never going to be able to, to move on ultimately to, to what everybody would like to see, um, or at least a great, uh, a great many people would like to see, which is zero deforestation without positive incentives. And in the, the current climate, uh, as Brian was mentioning, uh, what we are seeing is um, nothing like that. Uh, quite the opposite. I mean, at this point, basically, I think it's fair to say that Tamara appears to be willing to do almost anything and give away almost anything to, to curry favor and votes from the Bancada Ruralista, the Agriculture Caucus of the Congress, and they have come up with a succession of uh, um, 
increasingly uh, anti-indigenous, anti-environmental proposals, uh, many of which would have disastrous consequences for the Amazon should they actually become law. And you know, beyond that, there is a complete disconnect between development planning, particularly infrastructure planning, with all of its connections to the stuff that's coming in, come to light in, uh, in Operation Car Wash, and the environmental policies. So uh, that's, uh, that is a very serious um, set of issues that has been completely unaddressed. You add to that rural violence, um, I don't know, this, uh, I don't know, Deforestation, so it's a, still a success story in spite of everything that's happened in the last couple of years. Degradation, illegal logging in particular, and what we're seeing most recently as a result probably of, uh, of climate change itself. Fires, um, uh, not so much. So uh, there's, um, there's really a lot to worry about as well. Um, at the same time, I think it's quite interesting, and, and what could be decisive for how this goes in the future is you have uh, really in the Congress no resistance to the, to the Agriculture Caucus. The uh, executive branch, uh, left to its own devices, uh, basically willing to give up anything, kind of, uh, ridiculous constitutional amendments that would turn the right to, uh, the, the capability to demarcate indigenous lands over to the Congress, which has uh, uh, no capability whatsoever to do it and is, uh, and is very largely opposed. But at the same time, public opinion, the mobilization of the social movement in particular, but also a large part of the media, has, uh, has been strong enough that the Bancada Ruralista has not really managed to make any of their worst proposals stick. So uh, um, I think that's where the fight is taking place. International public opinion will make a difference. Um, and. Uh, I think uh, it's all hanging in the balance. Let me turn to Juliana, who is Brazilian, is a journalist, uh, worked for 10 years for the Associated Press, uh, now works here with us. Uh, you were on the ground uh, doing some pretty extensive traveling in the Amazon last year. What did you see? How did it speak to some of these macro issues that, that Steve just talked about? And what's your take um, uh, on the, the politics surrounding all this, specifically within Brazil? And we'll, we'll get to some of these other countries in a moment, mm -hmm. but, but let's, we can sort of keep it on Brazil. You know, what, what, what do you see as the dynamics there right now? Well, I feel like the deforestation is a, is a number. When you're on the ground, when you're traveling, as I did um, south, to north through Rondonia state uh, towards Amazonas state. It's an agricultural state. It has swaths of forest. Um, it has all of the transitions, essentially, that land goes through. You see, as far as the eye will reach, manicured soy fields. Um, that are you know the the stamp of of agro industry in that part of Brazil. Um, you drive a bit further, you see uh, cattle ranches um, with fields that are already more or less developed, tended. You drive further, you see cattle pasturing among stumps that have been burnt out. Um, you drive further, you see in some patches burning forest, and further you see forest. And w what's happening is this succession um, driven by uh, the economy, essentially. As soy prices in Brazil went up, um, it became very lucrative to, to plant more. Um, branches that had developed the land somewhat, cleared it of, of forest, sold to soy farmers, and pushed deeper into the forest. And so on the ground, you get a sense of how the economy, things like the price of commodities, um, how weak or how strong the real is, the Brazilian real is, and so you know how how lucrative it is to export. Um, how that plays with national politics. What are the priorities of the government? How are they signaling to growers, to to society at large, um, that deforestation is or is not a priority for them? Um, and the, the broader regulatory environment that is that is is, is developed at, at the intersection of these these two factors, um, driving through this region, for example, uh, I talked to uh, local authorities that were in charge of a program that. Um, 
oh, this, they're in charge of this program that basically kept track of what areas were deforesting and uh, doing so illegally and didn't allow those ranchers to get subsidized government loans. So the ranchers might um, argue against the, the fines that were being imposed, et cetera. That might take a long time. They may never pay that fine. So that wasn't very effective. But cutting off their access to those subsidized government loans was very effective. So for a period there, um, when you know, soy prices were, were, growing, were going up, and so there was a lot of incentive to, to plant, to extend um, deforestation. Um, it could have grown, say, between 2007 and 2012, but it didn't. Um, 2012 was a record a historic uh, low in deforestation rates. And part of the reason why it didn't it was because of measures like this that signaled strongly that how the government felt about deforestation that was willing to, to take some specific actions. Um, and so you, you know, driving through this, through this area, you understand how all of these things um, come together to, to determine uh, the, the landscape and, and something as, that can be as, as sort of vague as a, as a, as a number on a, on a piece of paper and a deforestation rate. Uh, you also see some of what Steve was referring to, um, this great disconnect, even during this period when deforestation rates were going down and the government was doing, was implementing some of these measures um, that would have helped in that in that regard, um, there was a total disconnect in terms of the mega infrastructure projects that were being unfurled in the region. And we're talking roads, um, you know, extension and pavement of roads. We're talking massive mega dam projects uh, along rivers in the Amazon that are designed to both generate energy and to transform some of these rivers like the Tapajos into essentially a conveyor belt of grain to take grain from the Brazilian heartland and out and ultimately into China and, and other, uh, other customers. Um, you, you see, you see the, the footprint of uh, projects like that, their impact on indigenous groups, their impact on the physical environment, and their impact on the social cultural environment. They draw people from the outside. Um, with those people comes a different culture, comes um, a very often a population boom that isn't met with sanitation, health, education, uh, et cetera. So you see, even at the moment when the Brazilian government was doing and saying some of those right things and was having a, a positive uh, effect on deforestation rates, this, this other policy that, uh, that was very disconnected from, from that goal. Um, so it, it's very complex, essentially. Um, at, even at a time when there is good news, there's <laughs> bad news. Um, but it makes it interesting for those of us who, who cover it. Maria Antonia, thank you, Juliana. Uh, Maria Antonia, um, you know, America's Quarterly two years ago did an issue on the Amazon, which I see well, you just had in your hand and then you, <laughs> you dropped. Uh, thank you. You can just show it to every. There you go. Um, and we did the launch event for that uh, in Belém, which is in Pará State, in the Brazilian Amazon. And um, we talked to the governor and some other local officials there. and. They said that the coordination among regional and national governments on Amazon issues is really still in kind of its infancy. Uh, that there has not historically these, especially at sort of the state and city level, these are bodies that tend to dialogue a lot with, you know, with Brasilia in the case of Pará, but they don't have a whole lot of dialogue with people who are much closer in Venezuela and Colombia and all the other states that have a piece of the Amazon. Um, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty uh, dates from 1978. So the, the framework has been around for a while. Mm -hmm. But wh what, what is it like in practice? What can you tell us about the treaty and how it's supposed to work and, and how it does actually work and, and why it's important to think of the Amazon you know, beyond just Brazil, which we focused on so far? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's really interesting the way that you framed it, because really, uh, it, it has been, it's a treaty that has been around for 40 years, uh, and not a lot of people know about it, even uh, in, in, inside those countries. Uh, and the few that has been written about it was actually, it's a lot of criticism on the, on the institutional, institutional structure of the treaty itself. Um, 
So as you mentioned, it was it was negotiated in 1978, and uh, it's interesting to see, to look at the reason why it was negotiated. Uh, it was right when the environmental agenda rose at, in, arose in the global level, and uh, there was this whole discussion about uh, the internationalization of those resources, such as the Amazon rainforest. So uh, the treaty really was uh, was a way for those countries to to tell uh, the world that they were doing something about the Amazon rainforest. So they were uh, taking care of it in some way. Um, and uh, after the treaty was negotiated and it was ratified by those countries, basically nothing happened. Because the, the, the response that they wanted to send to the world was already sent. So uh, they stopped talking about internationalization a little bit. Um, and that was basically it. Uh, but it was uh, the treaty really was established as a as an umbrella agreement. The idea really was to set core principles, and then for for countries to uh, to negotiate uh, additional protocols as the issues arose for the for them to really implement cooperation uh, in at a regional level. Uh, but it, this really didn't happen. So the only uh, additional protocol that was negotiated was in 1998, which is when they created the Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization, so the ACTO. Um, so uh, implementation was boosted a little bit then, because then they had a, a proper office. They had a staff. They had a, a little bit of a, a budget, because countries actually started only then to, to, to pay this organization to contribute to um, to the to the structure the financially, uh, which hasn't happened, uh, which didn't happen before then. Um, so it, it was boosted a little bit, and they started creating uh, development agendas. So they they uh, negotiated one in 2002, and then uh, uh, another one uh, in 2010, which really had a, a whole set of uh, of. Uh, 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 of uh, in, an agenda at the forest level too, so uh, in the short, short, medium, and long term. So uh, it has set a, a bunch of ideals, but uh, it was very hard to to actually accomplish them. And there's very little accountability. Um, and I think the main problem, uh, since you mentioned how uh, the local level and the state level, the main problem is that uh, it's composed of, of foreign affairs ministers. Um, from those countries, so you have the you have the diplomats basically uh, in Brasilia negotiating uh, all of those issues. They only meet uh, very rarely. They have uh, they're supposed to have more uh, frequent meetings, but which never happened. Um, so there's a really disconnect between between what the diplomats are negotiating there and what the what what's actually happening on the ground. Forgive the journalist's temptation to always <laughs> try to synthesize, but it sounds like a really terrible mechanism. Yeah. That was mostly there as window dressing so that countries could sort of hold up a sheet of paper to the world. Is that inaccurate? Well, it, it, the idea, I think, uh, it developed as a sustainable development organization. So it's supposed to, I mean, the idea is really good. So it, and, it, and it has a cooperative scheme that, that facilitates. Uh, so a lot of people actually, uh, as a way to... Uh, to criticize it, say that there should be a whole another or another organization that to to boost this cooperation at the regional level. We already have that that whole scheme there, which could be improved if uh, if there was the political will to do that. So this is sort of what I try to do in the book, which yeah. is instead of uh, just basically cr criticizing the structure, it's to to look at some examples of what they did well and what uh, countries are doing at the national level well that could be replicated at the regional level. Steve, let me ask you, I mean, in your experience, do these countries talk to each other about this issue? I think some of the states uh, on various sides of the borders are increasingly doing that more. You have uh, 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 San Martin, uh, uh, a couple of the other Peruvian states. There's a whole regional interchange between uh, Acre, Madre de Dios, and... Um, That's in Bolivia? Uh, yeah, in, in Peru, and then uh, so a, a adjoining Bolivian state that's been going on for some time. That really is a very um, uh, um, uh, participatory, bottom-up process to talk about this development planning. You have uh, more recently, Acre has been having uh, discussions with uh, with people in Colombia. I think at the f at the federal level, uh, much less so. I think. I think, you know, as Maria is saying, this, the, um, 
the, uh, the Amazon Pact has really been relatively symbolic so far. Why, you know, forgive, and I want to open things up to questions from the audience here shortly, but, but why, this question is sort of for all three of you, why does it matter in practice? I mean, why is this coordination so key? What is it that happens on the ground that makes it so important for these bodies to be talking to each other in order for there to be genuine progress? So I, I think that um, what very few people realize that there, there are nine countries that have the Amazon rainforest. And, and whatever happens in one country uh, impacts the other. It's one ecosystem. So it's really important to, uh, to have that sort of coordination because it's, it's, a, it's a single ecosystem that impacts everything. So if you do something in Brazil, it impacts uh, Bolivia and Ecuador and, and all of the other countries. But is there a specific issue like loggers, for example, who will, I don't know, flee from across from one country to another? Or, I mean, is there, Steve, can you help me with that at all? I mean, well, I think that's, uh, that's been the case uh, on the Peruvian border uh, uh, with Acre, yeah. which is also, uh, also happens to be the, probably the part of the face of the, uh, of the earth that has uh, the largest number of isolated, uncontacted indigenous groups uh, anywhere. So there's been a lot of, there's been uh, some cross-border difficulties there also, well, further up in Amazonas and the Javari. So yeah, there's some of that. I think ultimately the real promise is to be able to exchange you know, experiences, particularly experiences that work. I mean, if you look at what uh, Brazil was able to do in reducing deforestation, important detail, uh, while they were bringing deforestation down by close to 80% below the historical average, they were also increasing soy production and increasing uh, cattle yields and cattle production. Part of that is, uh, uh, is a result of the, of the kind of wastefulness of previous deforestation, but not all of it. There are also, there's, uh, there's a lot of operations that are figuring out how to grow more food on less land more efficiently. Well, that, those kind of technologies are things that, uh, that really um, need to, to get around. And potentially, this kind of organization could help with that. And if I may jump in, uh, one of the, actually the, the success cases of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization is really the, uh, the, the satellite technology that Brazil had, which was really key like, to, to all of those policies uh, that was replicated uh, to, the, to the other countries. So the, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization really took that technology and through a South-South cooperation, uh, uh, agreements, uh, it replicated that. So it gave, it established uh, monitoring offices in those countries and, and provided uh, technical training to, to officers there to, uh, to implement it. So it provided countries really with this uh, real-time information about deforestation when it was occurring, where it was occurring. You know, it's funny for those of us who follow Brazil especially is, is you know, we forget now because things have gone so bad how many things were improving at once during the good times. Uh, the economy, inequality, poverty, deforestation, crime. I mean, things, things, really, were, things really were good for, for a while. Let me, instead of getting stuck and sort of bemoaning <laughs> the way things are going right now, forgive me, um, let's, talk, let's look forward. Uh, what, in your mind, let me start with Juliana. But this question is for everybody. What's necessary to get back on that good path? Um, what has to happen at the governmental level, at the coordination level, and sort of there on the ground in order for this virtuous cycle to resume? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can look back to this period when things were going so well for Brazil, this period between, say, 2007 and 2012, when we were producing a lot of agricultural commodities and the deforestation rate was in check, was, was reduced. Um, and look at what we did right at that time. And some of it is... Uh, Funding for specific, I mean, right now the you know, environmental ministry has had its, its budget slashed. Um, the, the demarcation of indigenous land has been significantly curtailed. Uh, the president has been proposing these, uh, these measures that would essentially roll back a lot of existing protections. Um, 
we could go back to a time when we were implementing carrots and sticks, um, things that, you know, incentives for the kind of uh, more intensive agricultural production, um, tying uh, loans and other um, agricultural incentives to, to the desired behavior instead of just, you know, punishing the, the people who, who are doing um, the, the wrong thing. Um, Brazil has done it before and it's done it in the in the recent past um, signaling uh, some of it, you know there are some of these specific policies that that have specific impacts but there's also uh, signaling that the federal government does that indicates how much of a priority this is um, so the in in recent times since the the new forest code there's been a lot of signaling that this is no longer important um, I think that that sends an important message to local officials that are going to carry out these policies as well um, and in, in some cases um, I feel like there there are some subsidies some some things that the government does that essentially subsidizes further deforestation like uh, paving roads um, right now there's for example with the the Bahi the, the, this, this road that is used to uh, funnel out soy from the the heartland and and out into ports there's talk about paving it duplicating it um, creating a, a, a soy, a, like I say, a grain railway that would run parallel to, a, you know, various uh, infrastructure projects that would, to some to a greater degree and some to a lesser degree, create more development in that area and lead to, to further uh, deforestation and, and other forms of, of of uh, damage, so having that conversation uh, in in a more open public way, the, this government has not been very open to public uh, feedback, um, unless it's been it's been forced upon it by, say, Giselle Bunchen and through her you know through her Twitter feed. Um, in thinking of the, the impact of these, uh, I remember uh, President Dilma, for example, talking about the need for these mega dams in the Amazon in terms of, you know, Brazilians deserve energy. Every Brazilian deserve electricity. Nobody can argue with that, but how and where and with what consequences, uh, those are broader conversations that can still be had. And and I think that the capacity is there, again, for, you know, for these measures, um, for this political will. Um, for these conversations to be had, I think they were had not that long ago. We need to, to return to that time, return to that focus. And I think that takes, in part, a government that is less indebted uh, to the um, agricultural lobby. Um, I don't think it's going to happen under, under Temer. Uh, you know, under a, a weak president who is essentially who essentially owes his uh, survival to um, this agro-industrial lobby that's very strong in both the House and and um, the Senate. So perhaps in the next uh, after 2018, it's a time to retake that conversation. Steve. Well, first of all, I totally agree with everything that uh, Juliana just said. I think that's all true. I'm reminded of uh, a remark of. Um, a professor of mine uh, in graduate school was taking a, a course on Marxism, said that nobody benefits from the crisis of capitalism. It's very hard to deal with environmental issues across, like globally, when, uh, uh, when your economy is in trouble. So uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, I think that's a, a kind of underlying condition. Um, Beyond that, I think, you know, I think going back to better enforcement and all, and all those things is, is critical, but I think you know, we really need to, to see progress beyond that. I mean, um, consider indigenous territories and protected areas. Uh, in the Amazon as a whole, all nine nations, about half of the territory, that's a vast amount of territory. In Brazil, 40%, but still you know, four Californias. Well, unless those territories are part of a positive national development strategy that makes sense and that capitalizes on Brazil's enormous potential as a, a green superpower in a low carbon economy, it's gonna be a, a long, tough, uphill fight to maintain uh, protected territories, indigenous territories on that scale. I mean, uh, we know what happened in the United States, where Brazil and the Amazon is in a real sense, 
um, and a situation not so different from the U.S. about 1800, when a lot of the land west of the Mississippi was Indian territory. We know what happened here. Um, as long as the Agriculture Caucus, uh, 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 Mr. Bolsonaro, can represent the indigenous territories as these major obstacles to development, um, th that's a real problem. And the way to, is to get that get to that is to figure out pragmatic and real ways to um, create real value for ecosystem services. Um, it's, it's long seemed to us that uh, the international climate negotiations and emerging carbon markets are one of the ways, by no means the only, not the magic bullet, but one of the important ways that that can happen. And that would require a, you know, certain agencies in the Brazilian government to, to review their way of thinking of this. And beyond, I mean, finally, I think something else that really needs to change is Agri the agriculture sector and agribusiness in Brazil needs better political representation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I know ranchers in Acre, I know ranchers in Mato Grosso, there are people who are doing amazing things there. Who ends up speaking for them in Brasilia, um, you know, are um, people that uh, they don't deserve to have speaking for them, whose ideas are completely retrograde, uh, who fall back on, this, uh, on the, uh, the most kind of business as usual, um, aggressive, polemical uh, of rhetoric, and, really, and who have uh, essentially uh, no ideas for how to move forward, you know, whose, uh, whose fantasy is returning to the slash and burn 60s and 70s. Um, what accounts, and, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what, what, counts, what accounts for that distance? Why do you have such great people in the field and such um, lousy people in Brazil? Well, I, no, it's true that, that that rhetoric still has a lot of reson resonance in some places. Just like you know, what accounts for the, the fact that so many people believe that uh, the United States is really uh, looking at uh, how to internationalize the Amazon and undermine Brazil's sovereignty. I mean, there's no basis for that, but it's something that still resonates. And so I'm, I, I don't think that's enough to explain right. this disconnect, but I, but I do think the disconnect is, uh, is real. I think, you know, um, there's now a long list of, uh, of corporations, consumer goods companies, but also commodities traders who've taken on commitments to zero out deforestation from their supply chains. Uh, there's even, there are important states, Mato Grosso, for example, that's in the Paris COP in 2015, rolled out a, a whole basically zero deforestation rural development strategy. Well, you can't, you can't say that in Mato Grosso, but uh, if you look at how it's designed, that, that is actually what it's, what it is, um, I don't know, and I think those kinds of voices um, and the companies in particular uh, need to, to be stepping up and, mm -hmm. and I don't know, making their message heard more clearly. Maria Antonia. So I think one of, the, one of the roles that the organization has done well is really this role of information gatherer. You're talking um, about the, the, the treaty. The treaty, yes, yeah. the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. Uh, so I think uh, one important thing that it, the organization could do to um, to help uh, Amazonia in reduced deforestation is really to to use this role to to uh, gather the information from the satellites, for example, from that's been uh, uh, gathered by all of the eight countries, and see uh, a little more strategically uh, what's happening and where is it happening, or if there's a pattern between those countries, and uh, and to uh, establish protected areas in a more strategic way. Um, so things like that. Uh, I think another very important role is to, uh, like Steve mentioned, the, the best practices and to, to get examples from those countries and uh, have them look at the, the laws, how they implemented uh, international conventions, for example, and uh, see how, how they could share this, those uh, types of experiences uh, to, to be a little more effective uh, in, in that regard. Let me ask one more question, um, <laughs> with apologies to the audience. <laughs> But you know we're focusing here, and I think it's I, I mean, it's definitely appropriate. This is a, a policy-focused event. We're talking about big picture solutions. I wonder if we've focused enough on sort of the bottom-up, grassroots stuff, and sort of for people there on the ground. And what what can be done at that level? What have we heard from people who are there in order to you know also be effective on this issue, in order to make people in the region care more about deforestation, see it as something that they should be involved in? Well, I, I'll 
jump in because again in my my traveling in the region some of what I did is visit with various communities and and see and talk to local people see how how they see this issue and uh, there there are initiatives that are very bottom up and that are small but that are absolutely scalable um, I'm thinking of two two places that I visited one was um, Brazil Nut Co-op uh, essentially it was a, a community where all, it was mostly women, um, they were all involved in gathering Brazil nuts and with a little bit of uh, funding money they created a, a, a processing, um, to call it a processing plant is to overdo it, a place where the nuts could be sorted and, and you know, cracked and cleaned and sold at, a, you know, a little bit, for a little bit more money than they would have sold them uh, just you know, as they were as they were collected, and this quickly became a way for them to be productively employed. Soon, these women were making more money than their husbands, and you know, had this steady job that you know brought in uh, an income regularly. And so, in within the community and within those families, all of a sudden, people were looking at this as not just oh, this neat little side project, but something that's that's steady, that brings in an income that's important, um, something that could be valued and reproduced. Um, another, uh, another area that I visited, I visited a couple of um, settlement projects of the Inca, you know, land reform settlement projects. And in, in some of them, you have people who have you know very few resources and very little technical training, they get a plot of land. One of the most low-tech things you can do with a plot of land is to clear it and put one cow or two cows and live off of it with your family. With a little bit of technical support, a little bit of seed money, literally seeds, <laughs> seed money, um, a little bit of uh, technical advice, you can transform that small plot into a green space that preserves some of the, the fruit trees and nut trees that allows you to grow what you need for your family and to grow something to sell. Um, if, if you intensively farm a small plot, which is possible again with a kind, some, you know, some technical support and a little bit of money, um, it does give a family uh, uh, sustenance and it, it, it it's, it's better for the community, it's better for the environment, it preserves some of the, the vegetation that was there before. And this is, again, absolutely scalable, uh, absolutely doable. There are these uh, land resettlement projects, they're, they're widespread, um, and often they involve just the giving of the land and, and not any further um, support. So there are things like this that, that can be done at the community level and that can change people's minds by showing them very specifically how doing something slightly differently will support your family and be good for the environment at the same time. And you know, I'd, I'd like to see more of those kinds of examples. Anything to add? Um, no, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, th I think of, uh, of my friend, Krentoma Panara, who's on the, on the indigenous side of the frontier, not on the branches side of the frontier, who um, you know, was one of, the, one of the people that I met early on in, uh, in Brazil. He's about my age. He's a Panara Indian. Up until the end of the 1960s, he was living off in one of the most isolated parts of the Amazon. The government opened the 163 highway. At least two-thirds of, uh, of his people died in about five years. The survivors were then forcibly relocated to an existing reserve on another planet from their perspective, which is where I met him. He lived in his village for a year and a half, learned his language, um, came back. Uh, worked on my PhD in anthropology. Years later, he and his people asked me and some Brazilian colleagues to help them go back and see what had happened to their territory. And mm -hmm. we managed to ultimately wow. help them go back and reoccupy and get that territory demarcated. Mm -hmm. He's doing great, but he has a dilemma. Uh, he doesn't want to cut down the forest. Uh, it's culturally super important to him, but, his, but he doesn't want to be poor in the white people's world and economy. And his, his choices are very cruel. He needs better incentives. Well, if you look at you know, people totally on the other side of the frontier, like uh, 
Chico Salas, a sort of rancher that I met in Acre, who does everything right but has no incentive, even in Acre, he's just beginning to have a little bit of incentive to not be as bad as his neighbors. You know, they really do have something in common. They all need better incentives. And I think that's, that's true in the first instance from the bottom up, from the grassroots. Steve, do you want to write a book about uh, your, your friend there in the... Um, or at least a magazine article, maybe, for America's <laughs> Quarter. Not to put you on the spot in front of a bunch of people. I've got, well, I've got a couple things. Uh, and the, the, the book's a, a longer story. Okay. But, hey, Antonia, do you have anything to add on this topic? Uh, no, I completely agree with what was said. And one of the things that I looked at in the book was really those uh, uh, national approaches that provided uh, landowners with, incent with financial incentives, uh, really some different schemes uh, to, to provide that and provide the, the incentives for them to protect their lands. Thank you. All right. Well, let's open things up to the audience. Um, we have a microphone, and if you'd please just um, tell us your name and, if you like, what, what organization you're affiliated with tonight. We have a question down here in front. Hello. Thank you very much. I'm Stephen Cass. I teach at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, uh, among the infrastructure pro projects that were not mentioned um, was the Trans-Amazonia Highway. And I wonder... Uh, what the current status of it is and whether uh, whether you see it as something that will bring the problems that Juliana described or maybe some of the benefits uh, that Steve and Maria referred to. I would uh, I would steer this conversation this this answer first to Juliana who who can certainly talk about that issue. I did travel along the the Trans Amazon Highway a portion of it and when last I laid eyes on it, it was essentially a mud pit for half the year and just a dust ball for, for the other half. Um, it, it, as if you're familiar with the terrain, it's, I mean, there, there are dozens, and do, I try to count the number of tiny little wooden bridges, dozens and dozens of little wooden bridges in terrible states of repair. One of them, a car was passing right in front. I saw the car, the bridge break, and the car dip um, right in front <laughs> of us. Uh, I have pictures of it. That's the state of the of the road. So part of what was happening when I went back to Brazil in 2010, and part of what got me so interested in this is I saw the federal government talking about these big infrastructure projects that, in a way, that hadn't been discussed almost since the military years. You know, the big pharaonic dams and, and the Trans-Amazon uh, Highway is a project from military years. And here we had the Workers' Party talking about taking up the paving of the Trans-Amazon and, you know, bringing development to Brazil. So this idea of development that, you know, harkens back to the 70s. So there was a lot of talk about paving it. And stretches of it are paved as it goes through certain larger towns. But I believe that idea has been abandoned in part because the, the Trans-Amazon is kind of a highway to nowhere, if you think about it. It just kind of ends in Labria, which is no, just nowhere. <laughs> you know, it just, if you follow it, it's kind of an interesting exercise. It's like the Transpantanera, uh, a highway that was built through the, the, the Pantanal, the big swamp there uh, on the western side, to nowhere. So the, the roads that are really interesting right now are the, the roads that connect the, the soy and, and beef um, areas, like the, the 163. Um, and there is talk of duplicating that and or, and or building a, a, a railroad and or turning the rivers into a, a sort of a conveyance of, uh, of grain. Um, Another, uh, uh, there's another road um, from Porto Velho to Manaus that is also uh, the focus right now. But they tend to be more uh, north-south than than uh, east-west, like the the that, you know that section of the Trans Amazon. But it represents, it's a symbol of, of a certain idea of development, of what it means to bring development, of what it means to make an area, as Steve was saying, um, economically important and viable. Um, and what we need is a new vision, right? Not, not, not more of the old, which is what this previous government uh, very disappointingly seemed to, to, to turn back to. But hold on, and this question's for the group as a well. whole. I mean, is the idea of a paved road that antithetical to conservation? I mean, can't you theoretically have both? 
Um, well, historically, the answer has been well, what's, what predicts deforestation best is opening roads and then paving them. But um, in principle, um, there's no reason why that necessarily has to be the case. And where we can see um, that you, know, that you can break that link is in Acre, where, you, where the Workers' Party or Popular Front government actually managed to pave the 364 highway from one end of the state to the next for the first time um, and did enough planning, created enough protected areas, concessions, and so on, all the way along that they really they didn't completely eliminate deforestation, but they really um, controlled it very effectively. So similarly, on, those, on the road to the Pacific, that's across the Peruvian border. Order. So, no, it's, uh, but it requires, um, it requires planning, it requires investment. Um, you, know, you basically have to stop subsidizing mega hydroelectrics and subsidize sustainability instead. Mm. I was going to say, even during the period when uh, when Brazil was uh, effectively reducing the deforestation rate, deforestation along the 163, the, the soy highway, was booming. It, it's it, it, without that kind of very uh, clear policy and enforcement mechanisms, it, it tends to be a vector for all of this, the, right. the fish, you know, the fish spine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question and also for phrasing your question as a question, which was the part <laughs> that I left out of my general request. So may the next be so direct as well. I just want to get one question there towards the back. Yes. And we'll come back here to the front. Hello, my name is Leo Cerda. I'm from the Ecuadorian Amazon, and I work in like conservation and different projects. I just want to know um, from uh, Maria Antonieta and to all, what do you guys think about RET and like towards like this big policy process that one the UN is proposing to implement? You know, now we have RED Indigena towards when we're going back to the uh, conversation about deforestation, how to stop that, and what do you think about that? So first, for if, if someone would, would be so kind as to articulate what RED is for a, a general interest audience. <laughs> um, yeah, RED is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change speak for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. It's an initiative that's us actually we've been closely involved with for a long time, going back to before there was uh, RED. Uh, when, I, when I talk about um, about large-scale incentives for reducing deforestation and conserving forests and supporting indigenous communities. That's exactly the kind of thing that's, uh, that I'm thinking of. It's obviously been a longer, much longer developing uh, than we would like to see, but I think it's a, uh, it is potentially um, know, an enormously important uh, source of, uh, of support for really uh, positive, creative, innovative work um, in forest conservation, like uh, what many indigenous groups, uh, the, the, including the ones involved in uh, Red Indigena, uh, and uh, many of the groups in, uh, in Brazil as well are, just, are doing. So yeah, we think it's, uh, uh, it's something that um, uh, I recently heard it characterized as a terrific idea that's never been tried, and I think um, <laughs> it's it's kind of like that. Maria Antonia. Uh, no, I agree that it's a it's a very interesting idea and has a lot of uh, potential, but just with a caveat there that I think. Uh, the implementation can be a little difficult, especially because considering the indigenous people, uh, I think um, the part of the free prior informed consent and it's it's really challenging. And there have been several um, documented cases in which uh, it basically was not respected as it should have been. Uh, to basically, people get their signature and they never receive the resources for that. So just make that observation for regarding the implementation that's a little hard. Okay, thank you. Yes, down here front. Uh, thank you, my name is Marty Rothstein, I'm a lawyer. I really have two questions. One is really more of background. You referred uh, several times to the political and economic situation in Brazil. I don't know as much about Brazil as I should, and I'm wondering if you could summarize in one or two sentences what's happening economically and politically. I know it's bad, but I'm not sure why. 
And, and secondly, is, is kind of a different question, and it's uh, uh, you know, maybe a little remote, but uh, my thinking is that uh, a bad economy and trying to help it is not necessarily inconsistent with conservation. And I'm thinking of FDR during the New Deal and the you know, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, with irrigation projects and planting trees. And I'm wondering any way it, it might be political, po politically possible for the present government of Brazil to undertake conservation projects that put people to work, which was the theory behind the, the New Deal doing it. Well, let me try to address the first question as somebody who spends far too many waking hours thinking about Brazil. I mean, it's basically in the middle of its worst economic crisis on record, going all the way back to when records started being kept in 1901. Um, economically, for sure, I mean, GDP is on a per capita basis has shrunk by nearly 10%. You have to work really hard to mess up an economy that badly. And there are lots of reasons for it, ranging from, you know, commodities prices uh, having come down to mismanage of the government by, you know, the previous president, uh, Dilma Rousseff and then also the corruption crises unleashed by the Lava Jato investigation, which you know, I happen to believe is one of the very overwhelmingly positive trends to come out of Brazil in recent years. But you don't, you don't cause that much economic destruction without there being eight or ten different factors, and those are, those are just a few. So as far as the, the question about uh, you know, the second part of that with FDR, does anybody <laughs> feel compelled to step in on that? Well, I'll... I'll, uh, I'll just say the one big jobs program that comes to mind in Brazil in, 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 this, in this region that brings together this, you know, people who need work with, you know, work that needs to be done. Well, there's two, actually two instances where the Brazilian government has done this, both equally disastrous. One was the rubber tappers in mm. World War II, the rubber soldiers, where the Brazilian government organized this giant scheme to recruit men, mostly from the Northeast, sent them into the Amazon, people from a dry, parched part of Brazil who needed jobs, sent them into the Amazon with little or no preparation and largely abandoned them there. Um, I, I met some um, much older now rubber tappers in their 80s and 90s who talked about the conditions, um, the ones who survived, you know, the malaria, all the diseases, the animals, they, they had no resources. Um, they produced very little rubber, and the U.S. developed an alternative anyway, and so then the federal government really had no incentive to pay them, bring them home, anything like that. It was, uh, the, the death rate was astonishing. A second instance of that was the building of the Trans-Amazon Highway. Um, same deal. Let's uh, go, go to Brazil's eternal source of willing workers, the Northeast, which is uh, less developed, poorer to this day than uh, other parts of Brazil. Let's recruit those guys and say, you know, if you go to the Amazon and help build this road, we'll give you some land. Well, you get there, the land can't be planted on. Again, diseases, no support at all. There are still, there are people there who are still, this is the only argument I can think of to pave the Trans-Amazon Highway is that there are still families living on the side of that. It was, it was um, built in the mid-70s. There's still families waiting for that pavement, still waiting for that development to come find them um, in the middle of nowhere. So I just want to say it's like the idea is a good one, but Brazil's record on that front has been abysmal. So I have, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> um, the bad news is that for the panel, uh, we're out of time. The good news is that there will be a book signing immediately following the event, at which point our panelists will stick around. And those of you who had questions and didn't get a chance to ask them can do something arguably even better, which is ask our panelists face to face. Before we go, let me ask a quick challenging question. I like the way you phrased yours. What was it? You said one or two sentences at most. That, God, even I'm not that tough. Uh, but, you know, in, let's, I want to be somewhat brief with this, but I want to imagine, you know, let's imagine that we all, that we have a reunion of this panel 10 years from now. And um, I want to get your feeling for what the degree of optimism or of progress on this issue we'll be talking about then, and what you see as the single most important factor that will determine success or failure 
over that period. And Maria Antonia, can I can I start with you with that that sure. easy softball question? <laughs> yeah, it's a challenging question. Um, I think it all comes down to the political will, basically. Uh, the the well, I'm going to speak at the regional level since mm-hmm. that's uh, sort of my expertise here, but. Um, there are lots of ways in which this organization and this treaty could be helpful to the countries. Uh, I think the in 10 years, I would really like to see the organization more with a more relevant role, uh, both regionally and at the global level too. So going to a lot of the international discussions on environmental protection uh, and, and having a, a united voice from the Amazon countries. Um, but it really comes down to the political will, which is basically what uh, stalled the progress of this organization over time. Um. Thank you. <laughs> Steve. Um, well, I'll take, the, I'll take the optimistic tack. Um, I don't know, 10 years from now, and, I, and I, I know, I'm not going to say that I, th- that I think that it will happen necessarily, mm-hmm. obviously, but that, I, but that it's perfectly feasible, I believe it is. Ten years from now, you could see zero deforestation in the Amazon and across uh, uh, Brazil's other biomes as well. You could see Brazil having uh, global leadership on climate change, uh, having established a national cap and trade system, and engaged seriously in emerging international carbon markets, creating large-scale revenue and incentives for the indigenous territories, the protected areas, and for responsible, high-tech, highly productive uh, agro-industry and small family farming across the Amazon and the other biomes. Um, You would see um, the end, uh, hopefully in a lot less than 10 years, of Infrastructure planning ba- based on massive corruption and, uh, and kickbacks um, that really looks at uh, the actual economics underlying these decisions, which has essentially never happened so far. And, uh, and uh, beyond just the forest sector, Brazil um, uh, coming into its potential as a green economic superpower in a low carbon economy globally, and in doing that, helping to bring that uh, low carbon economy uh, about. Thank you. Well, and I would say, I think as a Brazilian, as well as somebody who's covered and and observed Brazil, that uh, part of how I think we could get to this is through new leadership. I think we're living a moment that Brian alluded to of extreme uh, disenchantment, to put it mildly, of uh, the Brazilian population with their leadership, Um, certainly the, the president now has the lowest approval ratings of any politician I've ever heard of anywhere. Three percent. Three percent. Congress is is widely regarded as as venal and untrustworthy. I believe 190 representatives are facing criminal charges of of some sort. So this this lack of representation felt by the um, large scale. Uh, Planters and ranchers in the in their uh, in the people who represent them politically is shared by the Brazilian population. I feel like when we have uh, elections coming up, we have uh, presidential elections coming up uh, soon. We have a tremendous desire for someone to come in from the outside with new ideas and a new way of doing things. And if I'm going to be very very optimistic, I will say that there's someone out there. That who hasn't manifested him or herself yet, who will come in and drive this change that Steve has just described. That's optimistic. That's optimistic. (laughs) And on that happy note, thank you to my panelists. Uh, Thank you to all of you for being here, and please join me in a round of applause. Thank you.